Many individual fallacies in economics are founded on the larger and usually implicit fallacious assumption that economic transactions are a zero-sum process, in which what is gained by someone is lost by someone else. But voluntary economic transactions, whether between employer and employee, tenant and landlord, or international trade, would not continue to take place unless both parties were better off making these transactions than not making them. Obvious as this may seem, its implications are not always obvious to those who advocate policies to help one party to these transactions. Let us start at square one. Why do economic transactions take place at all, and what determines the terms of those transactions? The potential for mutual benefit is necessary but not sufficient unless the transaction's terms are in fact mutually acceptable. Each side may of course prefer terms that are especially favorable to themselves, but they will accept other terms rather than lose the benefits of making the transaction altogether. There may be many terms acceptable to one side or the other, but the only way transactions can take place is if these sets of terms acceptable to each side overlap. Suppose that a government policy is imposed in the interest of helping one side, say employees or tenants. Such a policy means that there are now three different parties involved in these transactions and only those particular terms which are simultaneously acceptable to all three parties are legally permitted. In other words, these new terms preclude some terms that would otherwise be mutually acceptable to the parties themselves. With fewer terms now available for making transactions, fewer transactions are likely to be made. Since these transactions are mutually beneficial, this usually means that both parties are now worse off in some respect. This general principle has many concrete examples in the real world. Rent control, for example, has been imposed in various cities around the world with the intention of helping tenants. Almost invariably, landlords and builders of housing find the reduced range of terms less acceptable and therefore supply less housing. In Egypt, for example, rent control was imposed in 1960. An Egyptian woman who lived through that era and wrote about it in 2006 reported, The end result was that people stopped investing in apartment buildings and a huge shortage in rentals and housing forced many Egyptians to live in horrible conditions with several families sharing one small apartment. The effects of the harsh rent control is still felt today in Egypt. Mistakes like that can last for generations. Egypt was not unique. The imposition of rent control has been followed by housing shortages in New York, Hong Kong, Stockholm, Melbourne, Hanoi, and innumerable other cities around the world. The concrete ways that these housing shortages develop are discussed in Chapter 3 of my Basic Economics, 3rd Edition. The immediate effect of rents set below where they would be set by supply and demand is that more people seek to rent apartments for themselves, now that apartments are cheaper. But without any more apartments being built, this means that many people cannot find vacant apartments. Moreover, long before existing buildings wear out, auxiliary services like maintenance and repair decline, since a housing shortage means that landlords are no longer under the same competitive pressures to spend money on such things to attract tenants, when there are more applicants than apartments during a housing shortage. Such neglect of maintenance and repair makes buildings wear out faster. Meanwhile, the lower rate of return on investments in new apartment buildings because of rent control cause fewer of them to be built. Where rent control laws are especially stringent, no new apartment buildings at all may be built to replace those that are wearing out. Not a single apartment building was built in Melbourne for years after World War II because of rent control laws.
In a number of Massachusetts communities, no rental housing was built for a quarter of a century until the state banned local rent control laws, after which building resumed. Some tenants undoubtedly benefit from rent control laws. Those who already have an apartment when such laws are passed and who find the lower levels of repair, maintenance, and other auxiliary services such as heat and hot water acceptable as a trade-off in view of the money saved on the rent. As time goes on, however, with some deteriorating buildings eventually being boarded up, the circle of tenants who find the trade-off acceptable tends to decline and places with especially stringent rent control laws tend to have especially bitter complaints about landlords neglect in failing to supply adequate heat hot water maintenance and repair in short reducing the set of mutually acceptable terms tends to reduce the set of mutually acceptable results with both tenants and landlords ending up worse off on the whole though in different ways Another area where governments impose their own set of acceptable transaction terms are laws regulating the pay, benefits, and working conditions of employees. Improvements in all these areas make the worker better off and cost the employer money. Here again, this tends to lead to fewer transactions. Unemployment rates tend to be chronically higher and the periods of unemployment chronically longer in countries like France or Germany where minimum wage laws and government policies requiring employers to provide benefits to their employees are more generous than in the United States. And the rate at which these countries create new jobs tends to be far lower than the rate at which new jobs are created in the American economy. Here again, the overlap between three sets of acceptable terms tends to be less than the overlap between the two sets of terms acceptable to the parties directly involved. As in the case of tenants under rent control, those on the inside looking out benefit at the expense of those on the outside looking in. Those workers who keep their jobs are made better off by the various benefits that employers are required to provide by law. But the higher unemployment rates and longer periods of unemployment deprive others of jobs that they could have had in the absence of laws which have the net effect of discouraging hiring and encouraging the substitution of capital for labor, as well as the outsourcing of jobs to other countries. The trite expression, there is no free lunch, has become trite precisely because it has turned out to be true for so long and in so many different contexts. Perhaps the most detrimental consequences of the implicit assumption of zero-sum transactions have been in poor countries that have kept out foreign trade and foreign investments in order to avoid being exploited. Large disparities between the prosperity of the countries from which trade and investment come and the poverty in the countries receiving this trade and investment have led some to conclude that the rich have gotten rich by taking from the poor. Various versions of this zero-sum view, from Lenin's theory of imperialism to dependency theory in Latin America, achieved widespread acceptance in the 20th century and proved to be very resistant to contrary evidence. Eventually, however, the fact that many once poor places like Hong Kong, South Korea, and Singapore achieved prosperity through freer international trade and investment became so blatant and so widely known that by the end of the 20th century, the governments of many other countries began abandoning their zero-sum view of economic transactions. China and India have been striking examples of poor countries whose abandonment of severe international trade and investment restrictions led to dramatic increases in their economic growth rates, which in turn led to tens of millions of their citizens rising out of poverty. Another way of looking at this is that the zero-sum fallacy had kept millions of very poor people needlessly mired in poverty for generations before such notions were abandoned. 
That is an enormously high price to pay for an unsubstantiated assumption. Fallacies can have huge impacts.